Hi, this is Ryan Holger with Temperature Equipment Corporation. Uh, this week's webinar is on the Bryant Evolution Connects control. Uh, we're going to spend about an hour or so going through that control and what it's compatible with and how it functions and so forth. Uh, I should be able to answer any questions that you guys have, uh, so please do type them in the question chat box in the bottom right hand corner as they come up and I will take periodic breaks to check the questions to see where we stand. All right. All right, so the first thing um, with this control is that it's basically backward compatible to almost anything that you've ever had an evolution control on in the past. And we'll define a few things that are not backward compatible. But for the most part, every furnace, every fan coil, every condensing unit that you've worked on that speaks evolution control from, I don't know, 2005 forward, um, you'll be able to put this control on. Whether you have the, uh, the old evolution control, whether you have the more squarish control that I'm showing on the screen there, either way, you should be able to take that off the wall and replace it with the new touchscreen version, um, which is called Kinex. Um, so you should be able to do that with almost anything. Um, there are some times that you're required to use this control. Uh, if you have a, uh, a Evolution Extreme heat pump, 280 ANV, or the modulating gas furnace, 987M, you do need to use this connects control or there was a, um, a, a dash D version of, of this guy right here up on the screen. Um, the one that the model number that ended in dash D was a temporary uh, evolution control in the old plastic housing that was made until this touchscreen version became available. Um, so you could use the touchscreen version or the dash D to control either one of these modulation products. The older evolution controls um, could not do it because they did not have algorithms to handle modulation. They can only handle one, two, and three stage equipment. Uh, now that we have modulation, it's a little bit different. Um, there are some uh, unique things to the physical stat itself. Um, there's a USB connection on the bottom of the stat that is used for several different purposes. The main thing that most of you will be using it for is to upload your dealer contact info uh, as well as your dealer logo. Um, it can also be used to do software upgrades on the stat. So as new versions of the software become available, you'll be able to upgrade them in the field using that USB connection. And then the last thing that it would be used for, it most likely would be for end users to upload a screensaver photo. If they want a picture of the dog or the grandkids or whatever it is. And then I guess technically you could also use it to load schedules, but I don't know anybody who's going to do that. When you can do the scheduling over the web, I don't know why you would do it over a USB connection. You also have the ability to access this thermostat remotely, either from the uh, Evolution Bryant website, uh, from apps on your iPad, iPhone, apps on your Android product, um, any of those type of, of methods you'd be able to use to access this thermostat. The thermostat could also proactively notify you if there's a problem. It does have the ability to send out email notifications if, I don't know, if, uh, if you got a problem with your igniter or your outdoor unit stops communicating, or whatever type of error might come up. Uh, I'm getting a note on here from, from Ted saying that he cannot hear any audio. So I don't know if that's on my end or Ted's end. So if you guys could do me another quick favor and just let me know if you can hear me, then at least I know that I'm, uh, I'm good on this end. Uh, it says that I'm talking and, and, and sounds going through, but just want to make sure since one person is having an issue. So let me know that you can hear me again, please. Sorry about that. All right, looks like Matt can hear me, so I'm going to assume the rest of you can hear me fine. Sorry about that. Uh, Ted, uh, it's probably on your end. You need to either uh, unmute your uh, speakers or if you're using telephone, um, maybe redial back in. Um, so you'll have remote access to this. Um, remote access to an evolution thermostat is not a new concept. The current or previous or however you want to word it, evolution product did have remote access. You did have to use a module called a SAM, System Access Module, in order to, to do it. It was a little bit sluggish on the speed side of things. Uh, it involved some extra hardware pieces to be installed, and uh, it had some additional costs for that hardware, plus there was a monthly recurring fee. So with the new uh, touch version, the Connect Stat, all that goes away. Um, the the Wi-Fi uh, stat itself does not require any additional subscription fees, and the communication speed is uh, is quicker. Um, so we are we are using that now. Uh, Bob asks if the thermostat control software upgrades will be available over Wi-Fi. And the current answer to that question, Bob, is no. The stat has to be upgraded via USB connection, although there is some discussion of that down the road. But the product as it exists today 
has to be upgraded over USB if you want to upgrade to newer versions. Um, so the big advantage of this stat is the touch screen and obviously the Wi-Fi. But as far as you're concerned, you know, as the user, uh, the touch screen is the biggest difference. Uh, everything's a lot more intuitive than it has been in the past. It's literally like navigating your cell phone at this point. You just touch the thing you want to change. So if you want to change the cooling set point, you can see on the screen there, you'd hit the up and down arrows. If you want to change heating, you would touch your finger on heat, and then you would hit the up and down arrows there. Uh, if you want to change the system out of auto mode, you would touch the word auto. Um, so it's really much more intuitive than traditional thermostats have been, and even traditional evolution stats. Uh, that's kind of the advantage of the touch screen. Uh, and then obviously they're showing you there, you can load some family photos and things like that if you want to. Um, and you can see the USB connection on the bottom of the stat there. Uh, the stat does have a weather app built into it, so you can see the weather forecast. Uh, this is not all that sexy because everybody can do that on their cell phone these days. Uh, but it is kind of convenient. Many of you have seen evolution systems in the past, and you know that you can read the outdoor air temperature from the thermostat itself via an outside air sensor, either on your condensing unit or wired back into your system that you installed in the field. And it is kind of nice to see what the current temperature is. This takes it one step further. It still shows you the current temperature local at your house, in this case, 77 degrees. But it also tells you the high and low forecast of the day. Is it going to be sunny, cloudy, snowy, whatever? And then it shows you the forecast for the next four or five days also. So very similar to, to apps you'd have on your cell phone. It just happens to be an app built into the thermostat. You do have to have it connected to the Internet in order to do that, obviously. Uh, there is a website portal that we'll show you here in a little bit uh, to access these thermostats, um, set up your login, uh, change settings in your stat, download apps, etc. So we'll show you that in a little bit. And then there are uh, there's three apps available. There's one for iOS, which is used for iPad and iPhone. There's one for Android slash Google devices. Um, and then there's also an app you can download to use on your desktop, either a Windows or Mac desktop uh, app that you can run. So what exactly is this thermostat, or this control rather, um, compatible with? It's basically compatible with everything that has historically spoken the evolution language. Uh, that would be all evolution furnaces, all evolution fan coils, uh, outdoor condensing units, and heat pumps. Uh, all those would be backwards compatible. So if you have an existing one you installed five years ago, you can go ahead and hook up your thermostat to it. Occasionally and rarely, there might be some old preferred series condensing units that can speak evolution. Uh, this happened around some of those tax credit times when the factory uh, was trying to strip features out of condensing units in order to get them less expensive and still get tax qualifying systems. And as a byproduct of that, some of those units that used to be evolution that they made into preferred units did for a brief time have evolution boards, so you might be able to do that. If you think you have one like that, contact our tech support group with the model and serial and we'll let you know. Uh, but other than that, basically stick with the evolution stuff, um, furnaces, fan coils, heat pumps, and condensing units. There are small tonnage evolution rooftops out there in the marketplace that speak evolution today. This stat is not backwards compatible with those. So the only thing it really is not backwards compatible with is what we call SPP, small package products which are rooftops that you set outside someone's house and duct them in with package heating and cooling all in one box. It is not common in our marketplace here in the Midwest. So generally speaking, you won't have to worry about that too much. Uh, the stat itself also is compatible with anything else that you use with Evolution. So ERVs, humidifiers, UV lights, uh, Evolution zoning systems are compatible with it. In fact, this, this um, touch screen connects thermostat. The same exact SKU is now used for both zoning and non-zoning systems. Whereas you know in the past the evolution stat there was two versions of it, one with a, a uh, one that was just for regular systems, single zone, and one that was for a evolution zoning system where it had the Z and the part number there. That's no longer the case. Now one stat can do either system. So when you plug this stat in and power it up and it scans for furnaces and AC and so forth, it'll also scan for a zoning board. And if it finds a zoning board it configures it. If it doesn't find one, it assumes you got single zone. So one less skew that you have to deal with. Um, the other thing is that some of the features you'll see listed in the product data and the marketing literature and so forth for this, this controller um, may not work with your particular system. Um, so it can handle a bunch of different features, but if your condensing unit or your furnace does not have those features, obviously they don't magically all of a sudden have them. For example, um, the literature will probably say for this, this controller that it can do low ambient control for your outdoor condensing unit or auto defrost in the heat pump mode. 
Well, that's true. This, this controller can handle that sequence, but if you don't have the correct equipment outside that can handle it as well, it's not going to do it. So every feature is not available on every piece of equipment, I guess what we're saying there. Um, the stand itself, uh, obviously it works with your indoor unit, furnace or fan coil, your outdoor unit, AC or heat pump, uh, but it also can control your Bryant uh, ERV uh, through another communication cable. A um, little bit different than the evolution communication, but um, you can you can tie that in through a board. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, it can control your humidifier. Uh, this this evolution control, like previous evolution controls, has a built-in humidity sensor, so it can control your humidifier or the dehumidification sequence on your system as well. Uh, it can handle the static pressure calculations to tell you when your filter is truly dirty versus a timer. Uh, and then it also can do timer type stuff on your humidifier pad and your UV light and so forth. Uh, if you want to use this on a zoning system, like I said, the same stat will do zoning and non-zoning. Uh, and all the components that you would have on the zoning system are the same as you would have had on the previous evolution control. So the exact same model numbers of dampers and actuators, exact same model numbers of remote sensors, same smart sensors, same zoning board. Everything is, is exactly the same with the exception of the main user interface. You would use the Connects touchscreen user interface instead of the previous generation of the product. Once that user interface is connected to the web, you'll be able to access anything on that stat, set points, schedules, and so forth. Um, and you can see all of the smart sensors and remote room sensors that are associated with that system over the web as well. So really only the one stat really needs to change uh, on an upgrade on its owning system. And then for you, those of you that aren't, that aren't familiar, um, evolution zoning systems are bypass free. There is no bypass uh, damp, damper on the system. Not only is it not required, it is not permitted. Uh, instead of using a bypass damper, the evolution system takes control of the ECM variable speed furnace in the unit and uses that for static pressure control. So as zone dampers start throttling back because they're becoming more satisfied, pressure builds up in the duct system, and many other systems would have used a bypass relief for that. Uh, we don't do that with evolution. We actually start slowing down the blower speed, um, and we'll do that to reduce the static pressure in the system. If we reduce the blower speed to the lowest possible in order to keep the DX or heat exchanger uh, online and we can't reduce it any further, then some of the other zones will start tweaking themselves open a little bit to relieve pressure um, for, for that system. Uh, and it'll start using the zones that need or that will soon sooner need the heating and cooling uh, to dump it some air into those first. Uh, so here's the, uh, the part numbers involved in the system. There's actually two versions of this thermostat. There is the Wi-Fi version and the non-Wi-Fi version. The non-Wi-Fi one doesn't exist yet. Um, it, it's not available currently. So for non-Wi-Fi systems, we're still using the current Evolution thermostat. However, for the, the Wi-Fi product, if you want to get it on the Internet, that's when we're using the Connects touchscreen stat. Uh, so that's that first, pop, first model number there, SYSTXBB. ECW for Wi-Fi, 01. That's the one you'd be ordering for Wi-Fi. It comes with two pieces in the box. It comes with the thermostat itself, the controller. Uh, and it also comes with a router, as you see in the bottom down there, TP-Link. Uh, so it comes with those two pieces in the same box. Um, Bryant is shipping a router with each one of these thermostats. Uh, there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is that the thermostat itself does not have a very fast Wi-Fi chip. Um, I mean, it's fast enough for HVAC data, temperatures and set points and so forth, but it's not as fast as some other uh, consumer electronics might have. So what we don't want to happen is for you to put this stat on the regular Wi-Fi router at someone's house and then have the network, a Wi-Fi network needs to slow down to the, to the slowest speed of, of the slowest device, if you will. So we don't want your network slowing down at home uh, because of a thermostat and then now you're having trouble doing your Netflix video streaming or your online gaming or whatever it is. Um, so if you get yourself on a separate router, in this case Bryant provides one, then that problem goes away. They have their regular Wi-Fi network for all of their, their toys at home, and they have this Wi-Fi network for their thermostat. The other reason that we ship a router with a stat is to make it easier for the dealer to install. Uh, we print the Wi-Fi passcode right on the back of the router, so all you have to do is flip it over and read off that passcode and punch it into the thermostat to get it to talk on the Wi-Fi. Um, you do not need to, you know, interrogate the homeowner to get their Wi-Fi code or if, if they even know what their Wi-Fi code is at their house. Uh, it's already there for you, so you can set it up and install it without having to bother them. 
that makes it a little bit easier. Um, you can have multiple Connects thermostats on a single Wi-Fi router in the same home. Um, I believe the factory is telling us that four is the maximum. Uh, here in the training lab, we've done five or six, but it does kind of make things a little bit gimpy. So you probably want to stick with that four rule. Um, if you have more than four stats in someone's house, you know, God bless them if they got a giant house, um, but you need to put multiple routers in. And chances are you'd want to do that anyway because they're not going to have eight furnaces in one mechanical room. They probably would have them spread throughout the building. So you, the Wi-Fi communication can only go so far to begin with. So you probably would still want to have it spread out a little bit. Uh, that, that third part number there, wireless access point, that would be if you need to order this TP-Link router, again, for placement purposes. Um, so normally you would not have to order that. Um, by the way, the, the uh, Evolution systems uh, have a five-year warranty. Uh, and if you register them, which most homeowners do or dealers do it for them, then they have a 10-year warranty. That includes the furnace, the AC, the stat, the humidifier, whatever. However, there is one exception to that, and that's this router. This router does not have a 10-year warranty. It has a one-year warranty from the router manufacturer because uh, it's not something Bryant makes themselves. So just keep that in mind. It's not 10 years on, on the router. It's one year on the router. Um, so if, if you have a fail after one year, then you would need to either order this SKU we're showing you up here or get another router from Best Buy or whatever it's going to be. Uh, there is a back plate that you can use. Uh, you'll notice this thermostat is horizontal. The previous one was vertical. So that back plate might come into play there if you're upgrading one evolution system to the, to the newer evolution system. And then there's a hydronic heat accessory, which is very rare. It's for fan coils that have hydronic heating coils instead of electric heat. And it's the same relay we used on, on the previous evolution stuff. Um, real quick, Bob's asking, does the TP-Link need an Ethernet connection? Yes, it would, Bob. So that TP-Link is just like any other wireless router. Um, you would take a cable, an Ethernet cable that comes in the box with it, and plug it in to the uplink on the TP, uh, the router and then plug that into the homeowner's router. Um, so it would be getting downstream fed through the Ethernet. So yes, it does require a physical Ethernet cable to the, to the router. But you would mount this router right next to their other router. Uh, and then Bill asks, does the outside air, sensor, outside air sensor come with the control, or would you have to buy it separately? It does not come with the control, and the main reason for that is that most evolution systems these days seem to be going on complete systems, furnace and condensing unit. And the condensing units that speak evolution already have an outside air sensor built into them. Uh, if you do not have that kind of outside air um, condensing unit, uh, without that, excuse me, if you don't have a communicating evolution condensing unit, so you don't have an outside air sensor, you would have to order it separately and then wire it to the terminal board on the furnace. So it does not come in the box. You have to wire it separately. The pieces that come in the box are obviously the router, the Ethernet cable for the router, the antenna for the router, the power cable for the router. Uh, the thermostat itself, um, the, uh, the ABCD plug, the little green plug that you can use to plug into the furnace, that comes in the box with the thermostat. And then there are some interchangeable face plates that come with the stats. The default color is silver, but it also comes with white and black. However, I would caution you about, about selling those features to end users because it just changes the face plate. It does not change the side color of the stat. So if they will they don't want a white or black faceplate with a silver side, uh, I suggest you just leave it in the silver color for now. Um, zoning systems work exactly the same as they did on the previous system, so I won't go into great detail on that. Um, I'll just mention that um, you can choose whether on the zones whether you want a smart sensor or a remote room sensor, which is just a little sensor cube. Uh, and in either case, those will feed through the uh, the main user interface here and be accessible over the internet. We'll log into one here at the end uh, that I have here in the lab and you'll see what a zoning system looks like online. Um, the only zone that's going to measure humidity is the main user interface. Zones 2 through 8 will only measure temperature. They do not have humidity sensors. That's fairly normal because the humidity throughout your home should not be changing from room to room with the exception of you know unconditioned basements and things like that, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, we'll go through some of the setup screens here, but just real quick, you do now get five periods per day if you want to use five. Uh, there's actually only four schedules, but they can be used repeatedly, so you could have up to five. So you could have wake, home, away, home again, night, something like that. 
Um, the scheduling is different than what you guys have seen in the past on thermostats. Uh, at first, when I started playing this last summer, it, it seemed kind of weird to me uh, as an HVAC guy. But with the feedback we've been getting from end users all fall and all winter long is that the end users actually like it better. Basically, we're splitting the programming into two different discussions. There's one screen you go to to tell it what you like. Oh, I like it to be this temperature when I'm awake, this temperature when I'm when I'm sleeping, this temperature during the day, this temperature when I'm not home. You tell it what you what temperatures you like and humidities that you like. Um, and then unrelated to that, you tell it when you're going to be home, when you're going to be away, and when you're going to be sleeping. So I'll show you some of those screens here in a minute. Um, there's also a pretty easy to use vacation scheduling feature that we'll talk about. Uh, and there's lots of uh, reminder maintenance things that we'll go through here in a minute. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, do type them in the chat box down there on the bottom of the screen. All right, looks like we're all caught up on the questions for the moment. Um, so for the basic wiring scenario, it's the exact same as the current product. So you can see here on the right-hand side, we got A, B, C, D in the outdoor unit, either AC or heat pump. Uh, a and B are always the data communication. C and D are the 24-volt power. Uh, the condensing unit is typically wired to the communicating strip on the furnace. And then from there, that same communication cable daisy chains over to the main user interface. If you had a zoning board or a NIM card, which we'll talk about in a minute, those will all exist on the same ABCD wiring communication cable. Um, the user interface itself does have six terminals. The other two are for an optional remote room sensor should you choose to use one. So some people might want to put a room sensor in the space and then hide the thermostat out of sight, which is fine. Um, just keep in mind that the humidity sensing stays with the main user interface. You want to put it somewhere reasonable. So don't stick it like in a, in a crawl space or something like that. Put the user interface in a closet or something that's fine because the humidity there will be similar to the rest of the house. Um, and then for remote sensors, you can use the regular you know, Bryant remote sensors, the little you know, two inch by one inch white cubes. Or you can use some of the third party ones that we use, like the little button sensors that are basically the size of a shirt button, it's, although they're probably twice as thick and typically silver and colored. Uh, or some of those type of things, wireless, third-party stuff, those those kind of sensors. The outside air sensor is built into the outdoor condensing unit. If it's not and you order one optionally, as Bill had asked, you would wire that to the terminal strip here on the furnace. The humidifier also wires to the furnace. Um, so the humidity sensing happens at the stat, but the actual relay clicking action uh, happens at the furnace itself. Um, you may or may not need to add an isolation relay depending on the specific humidifier that you have. Traditionally, you had to use it, although now some of the newer Bryant humidifiers have one built in, so you would not need to add one. It just depends on what you're working with. Uh, there's an example of the remote sensors. This could be used on the zoning systems, or it could be used as a remote sensor on a single zone for the main user interface. Uh, they are thermistor sensors. A thermistor is basically just a resistor that changes its resistance value as the ambient temperature around it changes. Um, so it's a fairly simple device. It, does not, it is not polarity sensitive. So I can flip the red and white wires here and it will make absolutely no difference at all. It will work either way. If you are going to use remote sensors like this on a zoning system, you can see that it's only two wire required. However, I would encourage you to pull four wires. Then later on, if they want to upgrade to a smart sensor in that zone, it's very easy to do if you have the two spare wires already there. The smart sensor obviously measures temperature just like the remote room sensor does, but it also gives the user in that particular room a little bit more uh, information and a little bit more access. So they can change the set points and override them up and down. They can change the airflow, which is called fan status on this screen, but it's really just a damper positioning tool. Um, they can display the outside air temperature so they can see how they want to dress for the day, that kind of basic stuff. Uh, damper systems themselves uh, are four, four zones. Uh, on the left-hand side is where you wire your dampers. On the right-hand side is where you wire your temperature sensors. If you use the smart sensors, they're communicating over the ABCD wire, so you would terminate them up here on these top two. These top two terminals are identical. You can wire to either one. It's just giving you a little bit more space to land your furnace wiring and your zone sensor wiring. If you want to expand this up to eight zones, you can get a second board, and it actually would snap in the top half right here. Uh, and then you could have four zones plus four zones for a total of eight. On the second board, you just tell it that it's, it's uh, zones five through eight instead of one through four. So it's pretty easy to do. 
Um, this is just showing you a fan coil. Furnaces would look similar, um, but basically you're looking for some somewhere where it has a usually green, although in this case black, ABCD plug where I can terminate to. Uh, here's the same kind of thing on an outdoor condensing unit. Down here on the bottom, you see the ABCD plug for the communication. So that's what we're really looking for. And then right down there is the outside air sensor sticking through the bottom already on the condensing unit. So you don't have to wire that up if you have an evolution communicating condensing unit. That outside air sensor gets used for several things. Uh, obviously, it displays the outside air temperature so you can see what it is. Uh, it can be used to lock out compression uh, at a certain low ambient temperature, um, like, say, 45 degrees, for example, so you don't run compression below that. Uh, it is used in the heat pump auto defrost cycling on certain units. And then uh, one of the common features that it is used for is for humidity temperature, excuse me, humidity set point reset um, when it gets colder outside so you don't have condensation on the windows. Uh, condensation on the windows, as most of you guys know, is a function of the surface temperature of the window versus the humidity in space. So unless you're going to add in you know, extra layers of windows like storm windows and so forth, the only other way to prevent condensation on the windows is to reduce the humidity in the space. And this system can obviously do that. If you click manual on the humidity settings, then you just hit the up and down arrows to get the percent that you want. If you hit window protect, then it looks like that outside air temperature sensor and applies one of these curves I'm showing you here in the background. The end user doesn't see those curves. They just see the, you know, the more or less bar on the right-hand side of the screen. But this curve kind of gives you an idea. Right now it's on number five in the middle. So curve five, if it was, say, let's say 10 degrees outside, boom, 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 boom. Uh, I'm going to have a 30% humidity set point on curve 5. If that's too much humidity and my windows sweat, then I need to pick a lesser curve. Say I pick curve number 3. So at 10 degrees, boom, 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 boom. On curve 3, it's only 20%. If I was on curve 1, it would only be 10%. Um, so 5 is kind of the starting point. If it's a nice, tight house with new windows and all that good stuff, then you go to a higher value. If it's an older, leaky home, you go to a lower value. Basically, you got to wait for it to be cold the first the first time of the year to kind of tweak this thing to get it right, but then it'll basically be in sync with itself from then on. Um, so this uh, Evolution Connects control, as with the previous Evolution controls, um, can, can has to have a communicating indoor unit, a furnace or a fan coil. There's no exception to that. You always have to have a communicating indoor unit. However, the outdoor unit does not have to be communicating. Obviously, if you're installing a whole new system, furnace and AC, you should go ahead and use the communicating one and get all the benefits of that and the easy setup, etc. However, if they have an existing condensing unit that they're going to be keeping, um, you don't have to have a communicating one. The furnace itself has an extra relay output on it to switch Y1, so one stage of cooling. So if you have a non-communicating condensing unit that is a single stage unit, you do not need to add any additional hardware. You just wire Y1 and C from the condensing unit to Y1 and C on the furnace terminal board and the furnace will switch the condensing unit on and off via uh, decisions made by the controller through the communication. However, if you have a two-stage condensing unit outside, then you would not be able to do it with just the furnace because the furnace only has one spare relay. You'd have to get a, a NIM card or network interface module that I'm showing you here on the screen, and that can be used to get the extra relay that you need to switch two-stage equipment, two-stage non-communicating equipment. Or alternately, if you have a heat pump system that's non-communicating, no matter how many stages it is, you would have to use this card. Um, that's because a heat pump, even a single stage heat pump, needs two relays. One for Y1 to enable the compressor, and the other one for the reversing valve. And the furnace only has one spare relay to give. So, um, communicating equipment, no problem. Run the ABCD cable outside. Non-communicating single stage condensing unit, no problem. Just run two wires from the furnace to outside. Anything else, any non-communicating heat pumps or two-stage non-communicating AC, you'd have to get one of these NIM cards. Additionally, you might need a NIM card for the ERV option. Um, if you have a zoning system, you don't have to do it because the zoning panel, if I go back a couple real quick, already has the ERV connection on here. So there's a four-wire connection that connects the zoning panel to the ERV. But if you don't have a zoning panel, but you want to use a Bryant ERV, then you would need to use this um, NIM card, which right here on top right-hand side has the ERV control options. All right, so when you first get this thing all wired up and plug it in, uh, it starts searching out on the ABCD communication bus um, to look for where other devices are out there with it. So it first looks for an indoor unit, furnace, or fan coil, finds that, brings in his model and serial number, 
Uh, and based on that, he has a table so he knows the airflows it can handle and all that good stuff. Then it starts looking for an outdoor unit. If it finds a communicating one, great. It brings in the model and serial. He knows all the airflows that that guy needs. Um, if it's a non-communicating one, it'll ask you, hey, do you have cooling? Yes, I do. How big is it? Oh, it's 36,000 BTUs. Boom. And it'll base it on that. Uh, the same thing will happen on a fan coil with the electric heater. If you ha have the ability, if you don't, if you have electric heater there, you may have to tell it the size that you have, or a hydronic coil or something like that. Uh, then it'll ask you what kind of filter you have. Um, it'll give you a choice of an air filter, which is just a regular media filter. It'll give you a choice of an electronic air cleaner, which is fairly rare. We don't use those anymore, but maybe they have one. Or to give you a choice of the air purifier. Basically, what it's trying to do is figure out what the expected pressure drop might be through this filter media and use that to predict when the filter is dirty. The air purifier has the highest pressure drop, so it kind of you know, knows what that needs. The electronic air cleaner has the lowest pressure drop, and the air filters are in the middle somewhere, depending on how thick your filter is. But you're telling it which one you have, so it can take an educated guess at how much pressure drop to wait to see before it tells you that your filter is dirty. Um, this is normally enabled, this pressure monitoring feature. Um, basically, the way it works is that your system knows the static pressure, CFM, and RPM that's moving through the system at all times. Um, it does a static pressure check. Um, so basically what it does is it runs the motor uh, basically full speed uh, and then what it does is temporarily disengages the motor from the shaft and lets the back pressure of the duct system if you will slow the blower wheel down naturally and it calculates how much it has slowed down over a period of time. This is happening in milliseconds so you don't even really notice it when it happens really. You may just notice it ramp up you know a couple times a day to full, full speed. Um, but so it ramps up the full speed, disengages the shaft from the motor, calculates how much pressure resistance there was, and uses that to make calculations for CFM and so forth. And obviously it knows the RPM of the motor already. And one of the things it does, that the purpose of that is to determine if the filter is dirty or not. Uh, this would only work on the FE fan coils and the 987M uh, modulating gas furnace um, for the... For the um, condensing furnace and then for the 80 percent non-condensing furnace. There is another variable speed furnace 986T but that furnace does not have a communicating motor so it cannot do the static pressure type check. So that furnace 986T is compatible with an evolution control including this connects one it just can't do anything related to static pressure. Um, so it'll give you all the features we just talked about but it won't have this one. Um, so if you do the pressure monitoring, that says enable, and it does it based on how the filter actually being dirty or not. If you don't want to use it, you can turn it to disable, such as a 986T furnace, and then do the filter based on a timer. Uh, or if you have a house with really bad ductwork, um, I mean, obviously you should fix the ductwork, but if they're not going to do that, you might have to turn the pressure monitor off, otherwise it'll keep telling them their filter is dirty prematurely because you're already at the maximum static allowed by the furnace itself. Uh, it'll then ask you if you have a humidifier, yes or no, how often you want to change the pad, every 12 months, 24 months, whatever it's going to be for the particular humidifier that you have. And then you have the option of saying humidify with fan, yes or no. Uh, what that means is if I say no, it means wait for a heating call before I'm allowed to engage the humidifier. If I say yes, then, I'm, then I can force on the humidifier and the fan uh, even if there's no heat call yet. So that's kind of the choice there. Uh, the UV lights, yes or no, do you have one? If you do, how often do I change the bulb? Is it a one-year bulb, two-year bulb, three-year bulb? What is it? So you punch that in, and then after, say, one year, it reminds you to change your bulb. If you, you could also do these later on. You can not do them during the initial install. You can go back into the setup later and configure these accessories. Um, but I will point out that the end user does not get to pick these time frames. Only the installer does. The end user could disable the reminders if they are, don't want them or they're annoyed by them. Um, but they don't get to pick whether it's a one-year light bulb or two, whether it's one year on the humidifier pad or 18 months or whatever. Only the installer gets to pick these things. Uh, it'll look for a zoning system, and if it does find a zoning board, it'll go ahead and start looking for all of the individual zones. So do I got a smart sensor on that zone, a remote sensor, um, main user interface, what do I have? It'll go through those and build that list. Once again, um, the 986T furnace is not compatible with zoning because this zoning system does require the pressure and CFM calculations of that motor um, in order to do, to do the bypass-free zoning. 
So you can really only do this on the 986M furnace, or which is the modern and gas furnace, or the 80% variable speed evolution furnace. Those would be the only two furnaces, and the FE fan coil, obviously, that you can use uh, evolution zoning systems on. You cannot use it on the 986T, even though it is a variable speed motor. It doesn't have the calculations for airflow. You can custom name the zones. There's a drop-down list of the names you can pick, or you can type in your own name. So that way people don't have to remember what zone 2 is and zone 5. They can just label it kitchen, basement, whatever. That makes it a little bit easier. There's an example of that static pressure screen. And by the way, some of my photos in the slides here um, came from some of the uh, awesome marketing people that I don't know if they, if, they didn't, if they didn't know what they were putting on the screen or if they were just doing it to make us laugh. But obviously, I'm not going to have a half inch of static with zero CFM. Um, so... Uh, don't trust some of the numbers on these screens. I'm just showing you examples just so you can kind of see them. But it'll come back to you with static pressure and then a realistic CFM, so maybe 0.52 inches of static and, I don't know, 1,200 CFM or something like that. Then if you have a zoning system, it'll go ahead and do that again for each zone. So it does it once with all the zone dampers open. Then what it does is say, okay, open zone number one, but shut zones two through four or two through eight. And let's go ahead and do this exact same static pressure calculation just on that first zone so I can figure out how much CFM goes into that zone. Then close him and open number two. Let's see how much CFM we can shove into zone number two. And it'll basically will do it for each one of those zones uh, when you first start the system up. Then it'll know exactly how much air is going into each one of these zones. It uses that when it's setting up, when it's controlling um, static pressure to maintain the bypass free scenario. Uh, if I need to leak a little bit of air into a couple zones by cracking their damper open, by knowing how much airflow each zone is responsible for, I can do that quite easily without having very many adverse effects. So after all the setup stuff is done, uh, and there's obviously more setup stuff you can do. We're just kind of giving you a preview here today. Uh, but all that setup stuff's done, then this is what the main end user would see. This is their home screen, if you will. Uh, if they have it set up for a screen saver, like a photo of their uh, their puppy dog or whatever, it would show that here instead. If they don't, it tells you the current room temperature, the date, and the weather forecast for today, and whether it's heating or cooling down in the bottom right-hand corner there. Once they click on the screen, it leaves the screensaver home screen, if you will, and goes to the main display. That's where they can adjust their heating and cooling set points. That's where they can switch from auto to cool to heat mode. That's where they can switch their fan from auto to continuous. They can see their humidity. Uh, they can put the hold button on to hold it you know, for two hours at a special temperature all that basic kind of stuff from the main screen. You will notice in the bottom middle of some of the screens there's a little I. If you click that, that I stands for information and you'll get more details about what that screen is. Uh, I've noticed that most of the end user screens do have the I and they have a little description on what to do on there. And in, in the most current version of the software that was been released, I've noticed the I appearing on some of the service screens too, some of the setup screens. So that would be helpful, helpful for your installer. Um, to figure things out without having to have the manual available because those tend to get lost on job sites, everyone knows. All right, let me check real quick and see where we're at on questions and see if we have any questions to answer if we should keep chugging. Oh, looks like we already answered Steve's question um, on the 986T, um, so we're good there. And nobody else has any questions right now. If you do, type them in the chat box down there and we'll try to answer them. Um, so if somebody clicks the hold button, um, they get to pick how long they hold it for. Do they hold it until a certain time? Do they hold to the next scheduled period? Um, things like that. There's also what we call the touch and go that you've seen on some of the other thermostats in the past. Um, say you come home from work early, you can click right here and pick home mo mode, and it'll automatically go to your home set points as opposed to your away set points or your night set points or whatever. So you can override it fairly easy like that as well. Uh, if you click the menu button in the bottom right hand corner, it brings up two menu screens. This is the first one. You hit the down arrow to see the second screen. This is where the end user is going to set up their um, schedules. Like I said, it's a two step process now. Um, they tell their comfort profile. What do you like when you're home? What do you like when you're away? What do you like when you're sleeping? And then unrelated to that, you tell it what days of the week you're going to be home and not home and sleeping and not sleeping, etc. Uh, we'll go through a couple of these screens in a little more detail. There's a vacation button I'll show you here in a second. The reminders they can turn on and off. The end user can get a basic operating status display. Uh, they can change the display contrasts and things like that. Uh, set the time and date. Um, 
the service button. If you click and hold this service button for 10 seconds, that's how you get into all the advanced settings. So very similar to the old stat where you would hold the advanced button. It's a little bit different now. You hold this surface button for 10 seconds. The button actually turns green. And then when you let go of it, uh, it'll actually take you into the service settings for the technician. Uh, if the end user presses service on this screen right here, what they'll do is they'll get information about their dealer. So their phone number, their website, their name, their logo, if you've added it, etc. The end user can upload photos um, from this tab right here. The heat source button would only be applicable if you had a uh, dual fuel heat pump type scenario, electric and gas, or electric and electric. Zoning names, that only applies if you have a zoning system. Uh, wireless, which we'll show you in detail how to set up here in a second, and then how to set up the weather app. So looking at a couple of these real quick, we don't have time to go through every single screen, but just to give you an idea, um, for the comfort profiles, you have a home, away, wake, and sleep. And you basically tell it what you like during those times. So if you like it to be 72 degrees when you're home, great. You punch that in with the fan on continuous, for example, or auto mode. When you're away, maybe you want it to be 81 and you want the fan to be off. You know, So you get to pick for each one of those scenarios what you like um, and change those as you need to. Um, and you can change the temperature for those four scenarios, home, away, wake, and sleep. For humidity, however, you only get two, home and away. The wake and sleep modes, they just piggyback off the home mode, and uh, as do any manual hold settings. And the vacation mode piggybacks off the away. So really there's only two humidity set points, as well as only two set points for ERV, home and away. Either you're home and you want ERV fresh air, or you're away and you don't want fresh air. Um, same kind of thing with the humidity. Um, the scheduling, um, so the user configures their, their, uh, their comfort profiles for temperature, humidity, and ventilation. And then, like I said, unrelated to that, they do their scheduling. There's a couple different ways they can do it. They can do it the traditional way by coming in here and clicking on, you know, whatever, all weekends and configure that. Weekdays, configure those, or configure each in day individually, etc. Or they can use the, uh, the guide me scheduling, uh, where it's basically interview-based scheduling. So when you pick that guide me through scheduling, it says, you know, what time do you wake up? What time do you go to work? What time do you get back? Is anybody home while you're gone? What time do you go to bed? It asks you some basic questions, and then it builds your schedule based on that. Uh, so end users tend to like that a lot better. It's significantly less confusing for them. Um, so that's been going very well with the folks I've talked to that have had this already. Um, and of course, you can go in and override those after the fact. They built their whole schedule. They can come in here and say, you know what? Uh, my time really isn't uh, 9 o'clock when I leave. I click on away. It's really, uh, it's really 8.30. Change it to 8.30. Fine. It's fairly easy to do that kind of thing. Uh, or if they don't like one of these, when you click on them, you get the choice of just deleting it. Well, I don't really need a special uh, um, wake period. I can click on that and just delete it. Right? Some people only want to have two schedules per day. Some people want three, four, five. They get to pick how many show up here or don't show up here. The vacation mode is very straightforward and very simplistic to use, very easy. Instead of putting your stat in hold and then remembering to take it out of hold when you come back, or in this case, logging into it from the web and taking it off, you basically tell it when you're leaving for vacation, what set points you want it to maintain while you're gone, and when you're coming back. And then it completely ignores your normal scheduling for that time period. So this dude's leaving on May 28th. He wants to maintain 81 and 61 degrees. He's coming back on June 9th. And he's obviously a pretty anal dude because he knows exactly what time he's coming back, 12.57 p.m. He didn't want to round off, I guess. Um, so what it'll start doing is sometime during that day, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, it'll start tweaking the set points so that when this guy comes home, it's no longer 81 and 61. It's his normal daytime set points for, for that day. Um, so it's proactive. You don't have to freeze your butt off for three hours when you come home and you, and you tweak it. Uh, it already starts tweaking it because it knows when you're coming home. And, of course, if you're coming home early, you can just log in from your cell phone and change that. The end user, like I said, can turn the reminders on and off. But as you can see, they don't get to set how long they last for. So if you told the humidifier pad needs to be changed every 24 months, uh, that's what it is. They don't get to change that. It just pops up with the reminder or doesn't pop up with the reminder. This is the end user's operating status screen. It's very basic. It tells them if it's running furnace or heat pump, uh, is the fan on or not on, that kind of basic stuff. To get more detailed operating status, you would go into the service screen, hold it for 10 seconds, then you as the installer can see um, modes, staging, fan RPMs, CFM, static pressures, all that kind of good stuff that you would be able to use that we don't want to bother the homeowner with. 
They can change the display contracts. That's pretty self-explanatory. They can have the screensaver enabled or not enabled. And there's like a buzzer sound thing. If you click somewhere on the stats, say right there where my mouse is, that doesn't have anything you can do. It'll buzz at you and eh, like that to basically tell you that, well, basically tell you that you're an idiot. You press something that's not there. Uh, but if they find that annoying, um, they can just turn it off. So that brings us to the, some of the Wi-Fi setup stuff. Um, so under that um, same menu structure, you'll see one of them is Wi-Fi and have a little Wi-Fi symbol on there. You click on that, click Enable, which turns the Wi-Fi chip on. Then you click on Set up a Wi-Fi connection, and you can either manually enter it or scan. You're going to normally pick Scan, and it'll start scanning for Wi-Fi connections. Um, there might be multiple pages depending on your neighborhood, so there might be a down arrow down right here. You can click on to scroll through some more. The one that you would be looking for is going to be my HVAC something, so my HVAC 0B958, for example. Um, and that num that that SSID, that Wi-Fi um, access point, is going to be listed on the back of the router. So it'll say on there my HVAC and then some random number. Um, and the reason they have different numbers on them is because uh, if you and your neighbor both had an evolution system, um, you both would have a, a, a my HVAC router, and we need to be able to tell which one goes to which house. So normally, you're only going to find one. That's the one you're going to pick. However, if you find multiples, it might mean the neighbor's got a system or something like that. So you pick the, that router, hit next. Uh, you enter the passcode, right? And that also comes off the bottom of the router. On the bottom of the router, it's labeled as PIN. Uh, there's actually two different PIN numbers in discussion here. One is from the router to the stat, and then later on, and unrelated to this discussion, there's a PIN number from the stat to the website, and I'll show you that separately. Um, Matt is asking if you can rename that. The answer is yes, you could reconfigure the router to rename it to something else, uh, but you would have to get into the router and interrogate it um, through an Ethernet cable. Uh, I don't think most installers are going to be doing that, but technically, yes, you could rename the router just so like you can rename any router you want. Uh, my suggestion is to leave it as my HVAC so they know it's the HVAC network and they don't try to use that network for any other purposes. Because once they do, they're, they're going to get a pretty slow network and they're not going to want that for their iPad or whatever. All right, so you put that PIN number in, you hit Next. Um, that PIN number like we're showing you here comes off the bottom of the router. Um, it'll actually go then and take probably two or three minutes to connect the stat itself. Um, and then you'll go to, if you see here it says disconnect, and then right below that it says view remote access status. When you click on that, you'll get a screen like I have here on the left hand side. There's actually two things that have to be proven out to connect before you can do anything really. The first one is that is that network status, SSID. That needs to be green and say connected. Um, that means that your stat is talking to your router and everything is good there. The second one there is my evolution server. That will normally be red and say not connected, and you need to wait two, three minutes, maybe even as many as five, for that to turn green and say it's connected. So the first one is your stat's talking to your own router in your own house just fine. The second one is your stat is talking to that router, to your internet provider, up to the Bryant server, which is API dot whatever that is, ENG dot Bryant dot com, to that server, and then all the way back down into your stat. So that's confirming that I got good two-way communication out of the house and back into the house from the stat to the Bryant server. Um, and then once those are both green, then everything is going to be able to be work from there on. Your weather will work. You'll be able to access it from your iPad, that kind of stuff. But they both got to turn green. If the second one never turns green, it's probably because your building is blocking traffic from coming back in. That is not very common with residences. Uh, however, if you try to do this in commercial buildings, some of the... IT department security settings may cause that, um, or some high-end residences that have their own, you know, networks and all that stuff, and they're they're basically their part-time IT guy. They may have some issues, and you might have to work with the IT guy to get access. But for the normal houses, it should be no problem at all. I've not heard of any houses that have had any firewalls blocking them. Um, so once those are both green, you're good. A lot of times while those are turning green, I go back in and I put the zip code in for the weather app. I change the time clock and get some of those things set up while I'm waiting for this thing to finish connecting. Um, once it says green, connected, connected, then you can click on My Evolution Registration Info, and it'll pop up this screen in the bottom right-hand side, listing the serial number of your stat, uh, the MAC address, which is basically the Internet address of the chip inside your stat, and then a PIN number. There will normally be a PIN number in there. It'll be like... 
C1973 or whatever it's going to be. Um, if there's not a pin number, you can put one in there. We've had a couple stats that came out without a pin number for some reason. You can punch it in there, the ones in the white box. You can't change the serial number of the MAC address, but you can change the pin. You need all three pieces of these info in order to register your thermostat on the website. You only need it the first time, the very first time you set the stat up, uh, but this is where you get it from. You go to My Evolution Registration Info, get these three pieces of info. Um, usually I take a picture with my cell phone camera, so I have it right on my camera when I go over to work on the computer. Like I said, I usually go put the zip code in and stuff while I'm waiting, but the weather data for the, for the, um, for the weather app will not appear until after the internet connection is working and usually a couple minutes after that because the weather updates don't go out very quickly because the weather takes some time to change. So you might have to wait five minutes to get the weather update or something like that. And then as a reminder, that temperature in the middle, in this case 84 degrees, that comes from the outside air sensor on your local house, um, either on your condensing unit or your furnace. It does not come from the internet. Everything else comes from the internet. So the highs and lows, the forecasts, etc. Uh, the stat itself can also give you um, recent fault code history, um, so you can see that and, and pull up to see you know what happened and what time it happened. If all the times are funky like it is here, 1961 and stuff like that, uh, that means that you have not yet set the time clock on the stat, although you're probably never going to see 1961, but you may see like 2005 if you don't set the time clock correctly. Um, so you will have to go in and change those. Once you change the time clock, all the error codes will update with the correct uh, timestamps. So it's kind of nice to be able to see what happened on what dates so when they say, hey, yeah, come out to my house because I had this problem, you know, two days ago. And you go out there and like, well, I don't know what happened two days if I wasn't here. You can go back in time, if you will, and look and see what happened. You can also see these fault codes from the website, either from the end user website or from the dealer website. Uh, some products uh, like the, uh, the variable speed compressor uh, heat pump have additional features in them for like charging the unit. Um, so if I know the fan coil or the furnace that you're hooked up to, uh, I know, um, so I know the air flows, I know the outdoor unit's um, refrigerant holding volume, I know the evaporator coil's refrigerant holding volume because it asks me that, and I know how long of a line set I put in and what size it was because it asks me that as well. If I know all that information, I know exactly how much refrigerant can be held in this system. So it'll actually tell me how much refrigerant to weigh in with a scale. To, to charge this system, which makes it a lot easier to start up systems in the winter time uh, if I can just charge them by weight. Additionally, if you like, it'll also uh, help you charge it um, with subcooling. This is basically the same stuff we've had on the little slide charts over the, all the years, but now instead of having the slide chart, it's all built into the stat itself, so it'll calculate the subcooling uh, and you can charge based on that. Uh, and you can see you get some extra data here, the expansion valve position, the CFM, the airflow, um, things like that. Um, some of these condensing units have pressure sensors uh, and and coil temperature sensors. So uh, right now it's mainly on the uh, the variable speed heat pump, but you'll start seeing some more of these features trickle themselves down to other condensing units over the years here. Uh, Kevin types in, has it been addressed if the customer has satellite internet? I know the old internet connections would not work with a satellite internet connection. Does this work with a local network? If not, internet available. Uh, I'm not really sure what you're asking, Kevin. Um, all this stat has to do is get onto the Ethernet connection through the router in the home. So as long as they have a router in the house that has a network and you can get onto that network from any of the computers, the stat is just another computer on the network and it'll work just fine. If they got some weird satellite thing that's going directly to their laptop and not going through a home network, then that might be an issue. Um, or if they have a satellite service that's not on continuously and they have to manually turn it on when they want to use the internet, then it wouldn't work either. This has to be a continuously operating high-speed broadband connection to the home, which usually means DSL and cable. I'm not particularly familiar with satellite service, um, so that'll be a little bit different. Um, and Steve uh, types in that he's very impressed with the three-foot line set. Yeah, we're starting to stock in those, Steve, all those three-foot line sets, and you can just locate the condensing unit right in the basement next to the furnace, so it'll be a lot easier for your installs. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like I said, the marketing folks kind of put the random things they want in here to illustrate examples. I mean, additionally, I wouldn't be weighing in 15 pounds and 12 ounces on this unit. I'm probably going to weigh in 12 ounces because it probably comes with 15 pounds. But this just gives you an idea of what it'll, uh, what it'll be like when you see those screens. Um, you can also take this 
this uh, user interface and take it outside and use it at the condensing unit so you can do this charging and so forth outside while you're there. Um, the only thing is with those uh, Evolution Extreme heat pumps, they don't have the four wire A, B, C, D connection. They only require A and B. Um, obviously, we tell you to pull four wires if you can, and the C wire actually would be used for the common. The D terminal on that outdoor end is not even used. It's literally not soldered to anything on the back of the board anyway. Uh, but most of them will be two wire installations from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit on those particular condensing unit heat pumps. Um, so to bring the user interface outside, you've got to steal power from somewhere for C and D. We're just showing you here where you can steal it off of the condensing unit board to get power. So you can use that stat outside to charge the unit. Um, you can get error codes up on the screen. They'll pop up with a little orange box on the right-hand side. Obviously, you're not going to get a pilot light failure on an Evolution furnace. Um, once again, that's the marketing folks playing tricks on us. Um, but you will get legitimate errors like condensing unit cannot communicate, um, igniter fault, or something like that. Um, you might see pop up. If the end user clicks on that orange button right there uh, where the fault is, what it does is it brings up a little description of the fault, so whatever, igniter fault, uh, and then it brings up your dealer contact info, your phone number, and shows your logo in the corner. Um, so it directs them to call you for service, basically. So that brings us over to the website, and what I'm going to try to do, I got screenshots if we have to, but I'm going to try to actually show you the website live. We'll see how that goes here for the next few minutes. Um, so the website itself, um, the website that you would go to, as you just saw a second ago, oops, I didn't want that, because I shouldn't have did that live, uh, is myevolutionconnects.bryant.com. So once again, myevolutionconnects.bryant.com. Um, and then when you go to that site, which I just did already here, this is the first thing it shows you. It says... Well, which stat do you have? Because keep in mind, the old stat did have web access available. It was just not very popular, kind of gimpy, and expensive. Um, so you could have access it that way. Or um, you probably have the new Wi-Fi stat, which does not cost anything per month to do, and you would click on that guy. Um, this is what the main screen looks like. I'll show you a few of the things here. Um, down here at the bottom is where you could log into your existing account, which I'll do in a minute. If you don't have an existing account, you can sign up for one, which we'll do in a minute also. Before I do that, I wanted to show you a couple different things. Um, the first one is the Try It Out button. So if you click on there, um, then what you can do is click on Try It Out Now, and it'll basically bring up a little, uh, I'm not sure how this is going to look, if it's going to push through to your guys' screen, broadcast it out. So let me know if you can actually even see this, uh, this little Flash demo. I'm not sure if Flash uh, pushes through the webinar service very well or not. So if you can see it, let me know. Uh, basically, it looks just like the thermostat interface screens. You can click on it, adjust heating and cooling set points, show them how the whole button works, change the modes from heat, cool, auto. All right, Steve says, yeah, you can see it, so hopefully you guys all can see it. Um, and you can do whatever you want here and play all day long because it doesn't affect anybody. This is just, just a dummy stat. You can change it all. Every time you come back in, it's going to be back to, the, to the, where it started out. So you can show the end user what it's going to be like to change their, their set points and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's a very nice little demo you can do for them. I'm not going to bore you by showing it to you now. You guys can go on here and play with it if you want. The other thing is if you download the apps for your iPhone or Google phone or iPad or whatever, there's also a demo mode on those that you can use. Do not try to come to this website and use this demo mode from an Apple product. Uh, Apple does not support Flash, so you cannot do that. If you want to demo it from an Apple product, meaning a Mac computer, uh, an iPad, or an iPhone, you need to do it from the actual app. Don't do it from this website. So I bring that up because a couple of folks got burned on that. Uh, if you click the Learn More button, this is actually a very helpful tool for both you and the end user. There's some videos you can watch up here. And then as you scroll down here, there's a whole library of videos. And they're all like, I don't know, three to five minutes long. I'm not sure if they're going to be playing on this screen as we're all looking at it here. But you can see there's a whole bunch of them as I scroll down. Uh, and basically, they help the end user. It's like a, uh, it's like a video user's manual. Think of it that way. Um, so they can come on here, oh, how do I change my schedule? Okay, uh, boom, click on there, watch the video. How do I do my vacation settings? Okay, click on that, watch, watch the little video, and so forth. So that's pretty helpful for them to remember how to use their stat. Um, the third tab on here is downloads. So if you scroll down here, there's a couple of things. You can go to the App Store to download uh, the app for your iPhone or iPad. 
I guess, iPod Touch if you want to let the kids play with it as well. Um, you can also just go right to the App Store if you want and then search for Bryant Evolution. But if you come through the website here, you're going to get linked directly to the correct spot. I'll just do that real quick. So you come to that website from your iPad. I'm not going to download this on my computer. That would not be very helpful. Uh, but you can download the app right here. Same thing if I clicked on the Google Play Store it would, from my cell phone, it would take me to my, uh, to my Android app to download. And right below that, and not very noticeable, is this Get My Evolution for Desktop, either um, a Windows or a Mac machine. If you download this and install it on your machine, um, you basically can do the app from your computer if you want. You don't have to. You can just do it by logging into the website, or you can have this app running in the background and not have to go to the website at all. Your choice. Um, for you as the installer, this is very u fairly useful because this is where you're going to go to load your dealer contact info and load your dealer logo onto a thumb drive that you can use on thermostats. So you're going to have to go in here at least once to do that, to set them up. When you guys come to the service classes that we do, uh, one of the things we'll do is show you how to do that. And if you want in the class, we'll load up the thumb drive with your dealer contact info and logo right off the bat so you'll be already good to go. Um, all right, so that's kind of the downloads tab. And then the, uh, the last thing you do would be actually be going to your stat. So when you come in here for the first time as the end user, or you'll be doing this for them in most cases, and I strongly recommend you set this up with the end user or for the end user, you will click sign up. And the first thing it's going to ask you is, well, what stat do you have? Right? So what's the serial number, the MAC address, and that PIN number off your stat? If you don't have a stat, there's no reason to create an account. So it's not going to really let you do anything. So the first thing it wants to do is find that stat. In my case, I already have a stat on the wall here in the lab, so I'm going to log into the existing stat. On the bottom right-hand side, instead of, instead of creating a new one. And in my case, I actually have two stats in here. One is on a zoning panel. One is on a, uh, a carrier variable speed uh, unit, but it would look the same on a Bryant unit. It doesn't really matter for the purpose of this description. And I have one location set up, which is um, Melrose Lab. I can have as many locations as I want. If I, uh, if I bought a house, um, a condo in Florida, and I wanted to add a location for that, great. I can hit Add a Location. First thing it's going to ask me, guess what? What thermostat do you have? What's the model, serial number, and PIN of your, of your thermostat? Um, and then it'll load that just like it did these guys here. So I can have as many locations as I want. And then within each location, I can have as many thermostats as I want. So in my case, I have one location, two thermostats. Um, if I if I got a third system, let's say we get another one here in the lab, then I can hit add a new system. And guess what? The first thing it asks is, what's your serial number, MAC address, and PIN? What's the stat that you want to add? It keeps asking that because it's going to take that information from the stat and then permanently bind it to my account, to my login. Um, so if I ever uh, sold my house or whatever, I would have to come over here and remove this system from my login, um, which obviously I'm not going to remember to do. And my, my new homeowner is not going to know about it either. So what's probably going to have to happen is that um, we'd have to notify the factory that you know someone wants to rehook up a stat. Because it won't let you hook up the same serial number to two different accounts. One stat per account, basically. So let's look at a couple of these stats real quick. If I click on this zoning one here, you'll see that I have a four-zone system. It's 73 and 70 degrees on some of the stats. They all have the same humidity level. And that's because I'm only reading humidity in zone one anyway, so there's only one humidity sensor, so those will always be identical. Then they could each have their own heating and cooling set points and be in different modes and all that stuff. If I want to change something, I can just hit change settings, and it brings up a screen just like that demo I showed you. And by the way, whether they're using the stat, the apps for their devices, or this website, all of them look, smell, feel, and navigate the same. So you don't have to learn a different way to use your stat. Um, it's all going to navigate exactly like the stat that I just had up a minute ago. All my menus and everything work the same way. I may have some menus that are slightly different because there's certain things I'm not going to be doing remotely. Um, like I can't hold the service button down for 10 seconds and then change all your airflows and everything. I can't do that remotely. I got to be on site to start messing with your equipment for safety reasons. Uh, so there'll be a few buttons that don't apply uh, when you're remote, but for the most part, it navigates exactly the same way. Um, I can see notifications I've had, alarms on that stat. So here's some alarms I had back in November where we were probably playing with the outdoor unit, it looks like. Um, I can see who my dealer is that's set up on here. Right? If I got the other system, I can open that guy up. He's only got one, one zone, so I see him. I can change his settings over here. 
I got whatever current faults are on here. Well, those are just updates, 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 updates. But there's some faults. So if I go back a couple weeks, I got an ignition lockout. I bet that's one of the days Len Mason was doing a service class or something like that. I got dealer info down here on the bottom. Same kind of thing. Um, what else do we want to say here? Um, here, edit notification preferences. This is where the end user can put in the name of their system. Um, what I'm going to recommend you do is label it the location, then dash the name of the system. So, you know, maybe in your case it's uh, it's Florida condo, and then it's uh, you know first floor, Florida condo, second floor, and then maybe another one might be Illinois house, you know, first floor, whatever it is. Uh, you can name them however you want, but I would name them with the location if they have multiple houses, uh, because then it'll show up in the email messages with the, with, with the location and the uh, and the name of the system. Uh, if I want to pick a different dealer, I can do that. It's based on zip code. Um, you have to be on the dealer zip code finder in order to pick a dealer. Um, so if I click that, it'll show me. This is my zip code in Melrose. The closest dealer in this case would have been Riley. I could have clicked on him. Uh, now I'm his, my, he's my new dealer, basically. Um, a little bit down below that, I can pick my email address that I want to get messages at. I get a secondary email, which could be my wife's email address. Or in my case, I put in my cell phone text messaging address, so I can get a text message if I have a problem with my system. Uh, I'll just warn you that the text messages, you only get to read the first 140 characters or whatever it is, so you don't actually get to read the part that says what's wrong with your system. But you do get a text message saying there is something wrong, and you could log in and see what it is. The email version would give you the actual error code, like we had before, um, whatever it was, fault code 14, ignition fault, something like that. Um, the checkboxes here, you can pick whether you want to get routine alarms, which are like filter reminders, humidifier pad changes, things like that. Urgent alarms, which would be things like ignition faults, um, you know, condensing unit failure, whatever. Uh, I can pick either one of those or both. I can also pick receive an email confirmation when I change system settings. I would suggest you do not use that one. Every time someone touches the screen, it's going to give you an email, which would be very annoying. Uh, and I had it set up that way originally here in the lab, and then after Len did his first furnace class in the lab, I turned that off fairly quickly. Uh, then brand new that just appeared on here about two weeks ago is a new checkbox that says receive an email when my system loses contact with, with uh, the website for more than two hours. This is something we asked the factory to add because it's fairly easy to do. Um, so if I have a system where I where the factory can no longer talk to my stat for two hours, it's going to send me an email alert or text message alert. Um, so that would happen, let's say I got a cabin in Wisconsin that has an evolution system, and I lose power up there during the storm. If power gets restored within two hours, no big deal, nothing happened. However, if after two hours, carrier, Bryant and Carrier still can't talk to the stats out there, then it's going to send me an email saying, hey, dude, can't talk to your stat. It's been two hours. Something's obviously wrong at your house. Either your furnace is dead or power's lost at your house. Um, so then I'll know that I, hey, maybe I need to call the neighbor and ask to go check my sump pump, make sure my heat's working, some basic things like that. So it is kind of nice to let you know that I can't talk to your stat anymore, which probably means power failure. Then down at the bottom, I can also pick what the dealer sees. I suggest when you guys are setting these up that you probably don't check these boxes because I don't think you want to get an email every time your customer need, needs to have its filter changed. Or maybe you do. I don't know. It depends on the customer. Uh, or an email every time that they get a pressure switch failure on their furnace because the wind blew down the pipe or something. Uh, but you could choose whether to check those or not. I would check these two boxes. Allow my dealer to view my system status and allow my dealer to view my program scheduling and system configuration. If you check those, then when you log in through HVAC Partners as a dealer, you would be able to see that info for your customer. I think you want to see that for them. If they, if they don't want to, then they can uncheck it. It's kind of the way I look at that. So that's kind of the, the quickie version of the website there. Um, any more questions that anybody has? I see that Steve asks when the next class is. Um, right now they have we have the carrier classes set up on the schedule because that product is already released, and a couple of brand guys have come to that class. Um, the actual Bryant version of the class is not yet scheduled, um, mainly because I've been procrastinating, waiting till I actually see the stat on the shelf. Because um, you guys know how it is when they promise dates and so forth. Um, so I am told that we should have those stats quickly. I don't know if quickly means one week or three weeks or what. But once I actually see one on the shelf, 
then I'll go and I'll go ahead and release all of the uh, all of the dates. Um, so stay tuned for that a, a little bit here. Uh, but we're getting very close. That's why I was ready to do this webinar finally. Uh, I wanted to do it last month, but I didn't want to do it too much earlier than the product was released because I don't want you guys to you know forget everything we talked about. So we're getting really close. That's why we did the webinar today. And this webinar is also recorded. Um, so assuming the recording went well, you'll be able to go watch it online uh, online later. All right, any other questions? If nobody has any other questions, then we're good. Um, if you do have one, give me a call or send me an email. My contact info is on the phone. And I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and stop this recording. Um, Steve asks when the recording will be available to review. I'm going to upload it this afternoon, so you should be able to watch it again tonight or have a coworker watch it tonight. Bob asks, how does system how does system usage track work? Um, there is no usage tracking on this particular stat. Um, we have other stats, Bob, that do that, but this particular stat does not track um, consumption usage data. At least I've not found any screens that it does that on. Uh, all right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Any other questions, go ahead and email me or call me. And thank you guys for joining us.